Okay, we have a special guest with us tonight. Mike Samus came in uh, last night from LA. He is the VP of Operations and the, um, the CFO of Universal Music Publishing, which is the largest music publisher in the world. So please welcome Mike Samus. So, so you would like to do your um, PowerPoint first? Yeah. Well. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Is this all right? Is this thing working? So, uh, hi, my name is Mike Samus. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Thank you, John, for having me. I wish I knew about something like this when I was going to school, but uh, um, unfortunately I didn't. But uh, it's great that you guys get to experience this. Uh, uh, a little bit about me uh, first, uh, very quickly, just so you know how I got here. Um, I, I was a musician when I was uh, quite young. Uh, through the age of about 24, played in bars, played in bands. Would love to have had this many people listen uh, when I told them where I was playing over the weekend, but I usually had to just throw flyers around and hope people showed up. Uh, went, uh, graduated college in 81 with an accounting major after switching my major about six times. Went to work for a couple of large accounting firms in New York City. Worked for Ernst & Young for 12 years. And then I uh, uh, moved into the private side. I, I started off working for a company, moved to LA, and started off working for a company called uh, RZO. They did uh, uh, business management, band uh, uh, tour production. I worked on a couple of Rolling Stones tours. I, I helped uh, negotiate contracts for artists with major labels. And it was a lot of fun. I was, I was on the artist side. It was, it, was, it was, you know, sitting on the other side of the table were the record company guys and the music publishing guys, and it was really good to be behind the artist. So then uh, I did that for about two and a half years, and then uh, a music publishing company in L.A. offered me a job, and I took it, so I, I like to say I switched to the other side of the table. And uh, I thought it gave me a unique perspective because I was very artist side. I, I grew up being an artist myself, uh, and so I kind of understood the, you know, the the plight of the artist, and, uh, and uh, you know, it gave me a unique perspective on how to deal with it. Worked for Windswept, was the name of this company, for about two and a half years, and then uh, I, I got really lucky, and I got a job uh, at uh, what was then called MCA Music Publishing. Uh, uh, out of six uh, multinational music uh, publishing companies, MCA was number six, and we, were, uh, we really tried harder. Uh, but uh, about 12 years later, several acquisitions and a whole, and several billion dollars uh, to fund those acquisitions, uh, MCA has become Universal Music Publishing Group. It's now the largest music publisher in the world with uh, uh, 45 offices globally, globally, control about 2 million copyrights, and we are home to uh, some of the biggest acts in the world, Prince. Paul Simon, U2, Shania Twain. It's, it's, a, it's really a who's who of, uh, of popular music, country music, Latino music, uh, really in every country around the world. And it's a pleasure to work there. Universal Publishing is in turn a part of the Universal Music Group, which is also the largest uh, recorded music group in the world with something like 33% market share. Uh, Universal Music Group also has a lot of the same uh, artists uh, that where the publishing company has uh, 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 the publishing. Uh, and Universal is owned by Vivendi. It's not called Vivendi Universal anymore. I didn't update the slide. Uh, Vivendi is a French company. I guess you'd call them a conglomerate because they have uh, uh, an interest in Universal Music Group. They also own uh, a cell phone provider in France, uh, a cable television operator in France, and they just bought a company called Activision Blizzard, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, which they merged into Vivendi Games, and now Vivendi Games, which owns World of Warcraft, is now together with Activision Blizzard, which owns the you know, rock, uh, rock Band and uh, Rock Hero, whatever the name of that. Uh, I've actually played it, but I don't remember the name of it. So um, it's actually uh, uh, quite, a, quite an intertwined uh, group of companies, but uh, um, it's really been uh, a, a great evolution for me, and I've never lost sight of the fact that I started out playing in clubs in front of virtually nobody. I was a singer, and uh, there were some times where we had to start a set when there was no one there. So chin up, uh, and don't let it bother you. Just go ahead and play. It's actually easy to screw up when no one's watching. So 
what I wanted to kind of give you today was uh, probably a, a little bit of what you know about uh, uh, the music industry, uh, but kind of uh, might bring it all full circle for you and give you a complete view of what's going on in the music industry. Uh, it's kind of tough times, but it's not all that bad. Uh, so uh, what I tried to do here is give you a, a, a sense of that. So the first few slides I'll call fun with graphs, but I try not to bore you too much, and we'll see what you have. Here's an overview of the music market, and basically what you have is uh, a, a global retail market. You can see the downward trend from 98 to 2007, where uh, uh, retail value, the music industry, has gone from a $38 billion industry to a uh, $29.9 billion industry. That's in 2007. Um, 2008 will probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of $28.5 billion. Uh, that's, that's a negative uh, growth rate of about 2.7% compounded annually over the last nine years. So uh, you'd think it was worse because there are much larger declines in physical markets, uh, but that's offset by obviously gains that have been made in digital and mobile uh, and areas like that. Uh, so no matter how you look at it, um, going from almost 40 billion to almost 30 billion, that's 25% uh, uh, of your business sliced away, uh, which is about uh, uh, in less than 10 years, which is uh, not great. Um, this is a, a scatter plot of uh, album sales, CD sales, uh, using sound scans. Sound scans, that little thing when you run, well, when you used to go to retail, they'd run you through a barcoder and you'd, you'd see. Uh, and this is every year from the beginning of SoundScan till now. And each one of those dots represents weekly sales. And you can see right around the big amounts in the middle, we're talking 10 million units a week in uh, 1994. 10, mil 10 million, I'm sorry, 10 million units a week. So, uh, uh, and, it was, and it was growing. All those huge jumps that you see are the four weeks leading up to Christmas which is uh, historically the biggest selling weeks, obviously, in the music industry. Uh, the highest dot came somewhere in uh, 2000 at Christmas, and I, uh, I'm not sure why, but there must have been a great release schedule that year. And you can see the 10 million units a week were increasing uh, till it reached a, a peak in 2000 of about 806 million units for the whole year. That's a weekly average of about 15 million units a week. Uh, not surprisingly, actually, in, in 2002, I, uh, I, I actually went back to school and I got my MBA from, uh, from UCLA, and I did a, a statistical test to see the impact of Napster on music sales. And not, not surprisingly, there was a, a very, very high correlation between Napster and what you see directly after it. Napster was about 2001, and from that point, you'll see uh, the line skewing downward uh, to currently where you can see uh, uh, it's about 6.6% .6 annually uh, uh, of a decline, uh, and the sound scan was about 7 million units last week, uh, whereas uh, it was an average of about 15 million units in 2000. So this is physical product, and this is what's happened to the physical market. Uh, and part of the decline uh, in the physical markets came because the record companies made a lot of mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes they did was they tried to kill, uh, or uh, kill is a bad word, they tried to dissuade people from buying singles. They wanted people to buy albums, fifteen ninety-eight versus a single, $2. So what did they do? They, they, they basically did a, a concentrated effort to kill the single, and they succeeded. So this is the same exact thing, only with singles. You can see the singles market, uh, physical singles, is, has totally evaporated, it's gone, it doesn't exist anymore. But you can see that you're averaging two million units a, a week, actually going up to three million units a week. This is a fairly good business, a fairly sizable portion of the business. And right about that same point where the, first the music industry decided to get rid of the single and then it was just exacerbated by uh, the emergence of digital and, 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 and internet availability of, of music. So you can see uh, you went from a high in, uh, I think, uh, 1997. I wrote it down over there. That's 5.7 million units, that high. That was when uh, Elton John did a, uh, uh, a tribute to Diana uh, using Candle in the Wind, an old Elton John song. And that's all single sales of that, believe it or not. 
And uh, all the way up to last week, where in the entire United States, we sold a whopping 25. Uh, that's not 25,000, that's 25 singles. So, um, so clearly the physical singles uh, market no longer exists. What's, what's replaced it? Here's the good news. Uh, digital downloads. Uh, actually, digital, and these are legitimate digital downloads, so uh, um, I'll, get, I'll get to that later, but digital downloads are uh, increasing every year very, very rapidly, and these are, uh, as I said again, through, uh, through legitimate services like iTunes and similar ones, although iTunes is 95% of the market. Um, you can see it's got a little bit of a different kind of trend where you have the jump around Christmas, and then it still stays high and then kind of trails down at the end each year. That's because uh, the way digital downloads work, everybody likes to buy their friends $25 gift cards for iTunes. When, when those $25 gift cards are sold, you don't, we're not counting scans. But then people use them in January and February. So right after the bump in the Christmas season, you get the little, the little height and then it kind of settles down. Uh, you can see that the digital track sales have increased uh, 45% year on year from 2006 to 2007, and that's 844 million tracks in 2007. Those are single tracks. So essentially, uh, albums, physical albums are going down, physical singles have disintegrated, and they've been replaced essentially with singles because the, the large majorities are single track sales. There are people who buy complete albums on SoundScan, but for the large part, this is basically a singles market. Um, and for 2008, we're already at 884, so we've already uh, eclipsed 2007, and, uh, but you can see the growth is kind of slowing. Uh, so uh, it's still double-digit growth year on year, uh, but uh, it is slowing a bit. So here's the big, so here's the, uh, the big question for the music group. We're losing all this physical stuff, and we're gaining all this digital stuff, is the digital filling the hole? Left by, uh, and not surprisingly, the word would be no. Um, now, because uh, uh, of digital, uh, most, of, uh, most of the people who follow the numbers uh, are, are now looking at this thing called the track equivalent albums, which is they look at 10 singles and they consider it an album. So uh, now for, for the purposes of analyzing how the music group is doing, they take 10, they take 10, 10, 10. <laughs> Sorry about that. We'll edit that out later, right? Okay, so we take 10 uh, digital tracks and we consider them an album. So uh, if you consider that, um, we're still down. And here's uh, some of the numbers if you can read it. Uh, you'll see uh, those numbers are albums together with track equivalent albums. So in 2000, uh, 2000, that was 811 million, and skip all the way down to 2007, and you've got 585 million. You can see the year-on-year -year decrease is 3%, 5%, and last year it was unfortunately 9.5%. So digital is growing, and that's a good thing, but it's not quite filling the hole left by the digital market, and that's why the music industry is faced with a conundrum. They need to reinvent themselves, figure out how to monetize some of these uh, things that they're not getting through uh, legitimate channels and, uh, and, re and reinvent their business that way. So why is this all happening? In a word, uh, one, of the, one of the things is clearly uh, people point to piracy. So since we're all on the honor system here, how many people have downloaded a song illegally? Almost everyone, right? So... Um, this is not an unusual situation. I'll need all their names and addresses later. But, uh, just kidding. But uh, this is, uh, you, you find absolutely similar things at any university around the United States. And yes, we, uh, in the music industry, you realize that uh, uh, in one sense, downloading illegally is a way of sampling something before buying it. You know, that's some of the argument. But, uh, but, there's, no, but there's no really denying some of the facts. So I actually took this off a website uh, from the uh, International Federation Phonographic Institute. They tell me what I do is beautiful and ask why I'm not more popular. Then they hand me a pirate disc to sign. So um, this is a this is a actually famous song songwriter in uh, in Spain. So it, this is a global issue. Um, piracy is not just uh, uh, virtual on the internet; it's also physical. 
and, uh, and that still exists to this day. So just to give you some, uh, uh, you know, some statistics, uh, one in three discs globally is pirated. You know, you go to New York City, you see that guy with the blanket, and he's selling videos and CDs. Nobody's getting paid on that but him. Okay, so that's all pirated product, and, uh, and it takes quite a chunk out of legitimate business. In 2005, it was greater than one billion units. Now, that's gone down. Uh, the reason that's gone down is simply because the physical markets have gone down. Uh, but uh, 30 markets around the world, pirated discs are greater than legitimate sales. Uh, there are some territories like uh, Brazil where piracy is at about 75 or 80 percent. So um, uh, that's one thing that the industry has had to grapple with. Internet piracy is the other one, which is uh, essentially what you're doing when you, when you raise your hand. Uh, greater than 20 billion tracks are uh, illegally swapped or downloaded annually. Uh, now, granted, all of those may not have uh, been a legitimate sale if you didn't have the, the, a way of getting those illegally, but, uh, but uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big number. And this is uh, a big problem for the music industry, and it's a big problem for uh, uh, you know, rights holders in general. Uh, uh, the guy who, uh, who wrote the song, How Do I Get Paid? How do I, and that's the, the continual problem of the music industry, how do I compete with free? Uh, there's an awful lot of things that they do. I don't know if any of you have ever run into this, but in addition to, uh, you know, attempting to make an example of the occasional uh, person by, uh, by uh, slapping them with a lawsuit, um, the industry does a lot of things. They do uh, something called spoofing. Anybody know what that is? Spoofing is put uh, 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 thousands and thousands of songs on the internet that are garbage. So that when you go to out download uh, you know, the latest uh, track from the killers illegally, it takes you 20 tries to hit the real track. Uh, they literally load the internet up with spoofed uh, things with the exact title and all the other information. So maybe you'll download a mistake, get frustrated, and stop doing it. Uh, that's one method that the, the industry does. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that, uh, as a last resort, they, they actually look at people who uh, download unusually large amounts of files, and, uh, and those are the people they target for other types of actions. But the industry is trying to do something about it. Uh, one credible analysis, and I took this off a website, these are not my words, uh, by the Institute for Policy Innovation said that 12.5 billion of economic losses every year. So you want to know why it's going to be tough to find a job in the music industry. This is one reason. Um, 71,000 jobs lost. Um, I think I said to somebody else that when I started in the music group, Universal was about 15 to 17,000 people worldwide. Uh, last year we were less than nine. Um, that's just the way it is. As the, uh, as the business tries to grapple with, uh, you know, the impact of piracy and the lower business and, and reinvent himself. But I really think, you know, we're, uh, we're turning the corner. And this is why I, I call this, you know, the future. And this is the future of recorded music. Um, transitional to, transition to a digital business. Many uh, record companies, recorded music companies, are now getting 30, 35 percent of their revenues digital, either download or mobile. Uh, and mobile can be uh, master tones or anything, any kind of music that you might download on your phone. Uh, next year, I think Universal Music Group will be looking for 35 to 40 percent of their revenues globally to be digital. That's a huge number. So, uh, and the transition to a digital business requires a whole revamping of the whole infrastructure. The second thing is, and this is probably, you know, unfortunate but a reality, is they have to continue to do whatever they can to curtail piracy. And, and one of the big things they do is education. Try to educate people about uh, copyright law and, uh, and uh, the impact of what will happen through illegal downloadings. But one of the, one of the good notes is, is that, that that level of piracy, greater than 20 billion tracks in a year globally, that kind of illustrates the potential for the music industry. If you can do something, if you can offer people something that they'd be interested in, a subscription model, any kind of model that's not free but incredibly affordable, that together with education and, and other types of, uh, of things that are done will hopefully monetize some of that, uh, 
um, some of that lost uh, income. <clears throat> music, you might, you might if, you've, if you've done a lot of reading, you'll read that every music industry or every music company is trying to make themselves a 360 degree company. Uh, what does that mean? They realize that, that the recorded music aspect of the business is going down, so now they're trying to get into other things. Universal Music uh, recently has gotten into merchandising, uh, artist management. Those are two areas that are now part of the Universal family. They acquired a company called Bravado that does a lot of the t-shirt sales and the merchandising sales that you'll see at some of the concerts you go to. And uh, then they acquired another company called Sanctuary Management and they manage people like Guns N' Roses, Axl Rose, Elton John, and a whole bunch of people like that. So they're trying to create uh, you know, or run a, run a circle around all of the potential revenue streams that they can get from the music industry uh, as a way to, uh, to reinvent themselves and, uh, and overcome the losses that they've experienced on the physical side. Uh, yes, and continue to identify and monetize emergency, emerging revenue streams. Um, up until recently, you know, actually very recently, the music uh, group, the music industry, in fact, has now made deals with uh, you know, dozens of companies just like this. Uh, uh, Google, MySpace, YouTube, Grouper, all these businesses have uh, uh, now legitimate uh, uses of music, licenses to use music, and a, and a methodology to, uh, to have to pay and compensate uh, songwriters, publishers, recorded music companies for the use of that music. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the music industry has also been successful in closing down some illegal sites. Uh, uh, I know Kazaa was one that's uh, getting increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to navigate. And uh, I forget the name of the other one. Spiral Frog might be another one. But these are, uh, you know, the, the music industry is spending a lot of money, money that it could be spending on artist development and things like that, a lot of money simply trying to, to uh, close down. Uh, or, or uh, close down illegal sites or convince them to convert to a legitimate uh, offering. So that's recorded music. I just wanted to quickly flip to my area of the business, which is music publishing, where the outlook is certainly brighter. Um, music publishing is a more diversified revenue stream. Uh, we, have, we, we are definitely uh, uh, not immune to the problems of the recorded music business. As the, as the physical markets go down and as piracy takes over there, uh, we have to count on other revenue streams like performance and synchronization. These are revenue streams that are growing. All analysts think they'll continue to grow. And for us, it, it creates a, a decidedly rosier picture. So from a publishing perspective, there are really only two things uh, which are driving value away from the business, and that's piracy on the mechanical side and alternative, alternative entertainment. People only have a certain amount of money to spend on entertainment, and do they put it into music, CD, digital, or do they buy a game or a, or a DVD or something like that? You're, you're basically competing for the entertainment dollar. Uh, on, the other side, on the other hand, every other uh, area of the business I would consider, uh, uh, the, we're, we're driving value towards the business. Uh, performance collections are up, synchronization collections are up, emerging markets, we're finally beginning to collect in places like India and China, where half of the world's population is. There are small amounts, but it's a start. So we're, we're, we're finally starting to get that. Uh, digital and mobile and other new revenue streams, like I said, like merchandising. Now we're starting to uh, put uh, lyrics, we call them lyric tees, lyric t-shirts, putting popular lyrics on t-shirts and actually monetizing that so that we can uh, um, make additional money for the songwriters and such. Oops, sorry. I went ahead too far. Okay, so here you go. So just what does that all mean for our business? In 2002, 60.8% of our business was mechanical. That's record sales. And uh, our numbers are, not, are up in the most recent year but only 44% of our business is mechanicals. So uh, even though our numbers are growing, uh, obviously the business is shifting away from mechanicals and shifting towards things like performance and digital uh, in the same uh, light. So here's a market forecast. While it's, the market forecast is down for the, uh, for the recorded music side, for music publishing it's up. Uh, and it's uh, expected to grow 
at a, at a CAGR of 1.6 percent uh, through 2012, and that's exactly as you would expect based on everything I just said. Digital is growing, all these other areas are growing, offset by the decline in the physical markets. Uh, so the future of music publishing. Um, music publishing, even though it's not a record company, our priorities are directly correlated with IFPI. IFPI is the, uh, uh, the, the global governing body uh, that is uh, fighting the fight against piracy and trying to uh, you know, help us monetize these revenue streams. So our, our priorities are really perfectly aligned with theirs. Uh, it's, but publishing is a much lower risk business because we have other stable cash flows that are not impacted by, uh, by what's happening in the market. Song use needs the publishing side. This is really interesting. How many times have you gone to a, a, a movie or seen a commercial where you heard a song you know, but it's not by who you know it? So it's not the original artist doing it, it's someone else. Now, whenever you want to use music in a commercial or in a movie or anything like that, you need to obtain two licenses. One from the publishing company, that's called the synchronization license, and one from the record company, that's called the master license. A lot of times people can't afford both, so what do they do? They record their own song, and they don't bother going to the record company and getting a license for the master, but the publisher still gets paid. You can't use, the pub you can't use a published song, copyrighted work, without going to the publisher. So as people try to uh, you know, use, do more with less money, and uh, deal with things like downturn in the market or lower music budgets in a movie, this side's going to lose, the master use side, and the record companies won't get those uses, but you always have to come to the publisher. So that's another reason why our business is still up. And there's been significant merger and acquisition activity in the, in the publishing space. People still consider publishing an annuity. Uh, buy, buy it, and it'll always grow. It's like art, uh, you know, intellectual property, copyright. It's like artwork. It, it, it grows in value as opposed to de deteriorates in value. And the, the multiples that are actually out there for music publishing uh, companies actually uh, support the fact that the, the music publishing business is still strong. And classic songs. So, you know, you, if you have a good song, I said this this morning to... Uh, to the freshman class that I spoke to. If you have a good song, it becomes what we call an evergreen. And an evergreen is just like if you saw the movie, um, uh, what's the movie with Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson, A Star is Born, right? <laughs> there was a great song that, uh, that uh, Barbara Streisand sings in that song, I know, you don't know, but it's called Evergreen. And Evergreen is a song that goes on and on. Every year somebody re-records it and it creates another life of its own or it's been re-recorded thousands of times by different artists because it's, it's just an amazing song. Like Yesterday by the Beatles is an evergreen. You know, it's been recorded by thousands of different people. Uh, and that creates a whole new product life cycle for that song every time it happens. And, uh, you know, apropos to that, I thought I'd, I'd share some information with you. This is probably uh, very interesting to people who don't know this. So for Universal Publishing, uh, I decided I'll show you the top 10 songs that actually earn money uh, for our company, and this is globally. I looked at 2007, I got the top amount of money made by any song, and they're in declining order. We can't go 10 to 1 like uh, David Letterman, but I'll show you that most of these are what we would call evergreens. The highest earning song in the catalog is Sweet Home Alabama. So I'm sure you know that song, and uh, it's just amazing. Every, it's re-recorded, everybody does it, everybody wants it in a movie, makes a phenomenal amount of money. Obviously, the, we have millions of copyrights, and this is the highest earning song. Number two, I Will Survive. A, th a throwaway, as I like to say, 1978 disco song that is just unbelievable. I think it makes in excess of a million four annually, to be perfectly honest. Uh, there's only one song on the 10 that I don't know. Maybe somebody out there will, but that's the one. I have no idea what that is. Anybody have any idea what that is? is that, there you go. So, well, you'll see why, actually, s some of this happens, right? Look at number four. Isn't that an interesting one? Can anybody hum a few bars? Who wants to be a millionaire? That's the theme music from the television show. You get, you get your song used in a television show, I'll tell you what else would be up there, Law and Order, if we had it. But you, you get your theme music in a television show and you can sit back and collect the royalty checks. It's pretty interesting. So we happened to sign some writer in the UK. I think Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is originally a UK 
uh, uh, television show that was converted to the US. And the guy who wrote the music was just some staff writer in our UK office. And he wrote the music, put it in there, and, and now he's, uh, he's, I think he owns an island somewhere. <laughs> Number five is One. That's a, uh, a pretty popular song by U2, some of you might know. Born to be Wild, uh, another 1960s song. I think this is 67 by a band called Steppenwolf. Uh, the claim to fame of this song is it's the, the first song ever to use the words heavy metal in the lyrics, but there you go. American Pie, Don McLean. This, uh, I think this guy has 10,000 acres in Maine or whatever. And, uh, there aren't many people who know any songs besides this one, but this is a song that's been re-recorded by many, including Madonna and, uh, and uh, many others. Feeling All Right, I believe that's Dave Mason, uh, although I'm not a big Dave Mason guy, so I don't know. Is that Dave Mason? Yeah, it's Dave Mason. Number nine, 59th Street Bridge song. Anybody know that song? Paul Simon. Paul Simon. Most people know it as Feeling Groovy, which is probably a phrase that many of you don't even know, but... Uh, there you go. And the last uh, song is Strangers in the Night by everybody's favorite Frank Sinatra. So you can see that the point that I, I wanted to, other than this is interesting, the point that I wanted to make here is out of the 10 songs, you literally have seven, at least, that are what we would call evergreens. They'll always be our top earning songs every year, year in and year out. Every now and then you'll have some big album come out and jump up there for once, but these songs will be there every year. And that goes to, you know, the value of a, uh, of a song. So um, that is it for me. And I just wanted to, you know, hopefully give you guys some insight into the, the music industry from my uh, perspective. And uh, that's that. Fifteen minutes left. Why don't you have a seat and let's ask cool questions. Because this is the guy that knows everything about how to get a job in the publishing company, how to get your song placed for the publishing company, how to make a lot of money. So here's, here's the man. Come on and answer these oh, questions. So this is 15 minutes to ask um, the, the key questions of your career. Ah, Claire, step right up. Hi. Um, so now that you're, you said, is it CFO or something of Universal Music, all of us are being trained on how to start our businesses do-it-yourself. We're all being trained to do our own publishing, to do our own management. We're seeing how far we can go without resorting to larger companies. So. As we grow and as the DIY market gets larger, do you think that the major labels and the DIY musicians are going to be able to coexist? Or are the major labels kind of come, going to come back from this whole digital kind of download fallback and kind of go back? Peacock. Yeah, you know I didn't hear I'm one saying? thing. Do I think the major labels and who are going to be able to coexist? The do-it-yourself musicians, oh. like all of us that are being trained to kind of just take everything on and... Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I think there's two questions there. I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, one, one would be, do I think the record companies uh, or the music industry rebounds from all this? And uh, really not lip service, I really think uh, they do. I don't think we've hit, uh, the music industry has hit bottom yet. But uh, uh, as, I, as I said on one of my slides for the future, there's a lot of positive things that's happening and there's a lot of uh, inroads being made. Uh, in monetizing some of the things that previously, uh, you know, provided zero revenues. So the, 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 they're not sitting back and hoping that people will stop downloading for free. They're doing something about it. They're re-energizing themselves and re-engineering their businesses. Will they be able to, uh, as far as what you guys are doing, I think that's great ground level experience. But I, I, I think it's going to be the rare individual who graduates from uh, here or anywhere, and the very next day starts their own company and can compete on that level. Because you need, uh, you need the global reach to, to be able to consider yourself a full sale publisher. What you will have is all the knowledge that will be able you to do that, but it will take time before you can um, um, have the resources to have the global reach of anyone else. So. Um, so I think that uh, you know, what that does is that gives you a foundation to be able to go out and do it yourself. And, uh, and that foundation is invaluable. But uh, you'll always need majors, because majors will always be uh, um, somebody that uh, Paul Simon looks to or, or Prince. Why? Because they want an obscene amount of money. They want global reach. They want to know they're going to collect every nickel 
in Sri Lanka, which is a difficult place to collect in if you're independent. But then they'll, they'll always be that band that is making money that wants somebody to uh, do their business, and that's where independents or, or essentially startups come. So there's a market for both, depending on where artists and songwriters are in the spectrum. Anybody else? Everybody's happy. <laughs> in your personal opinion, what do you think is the largest market that publishing is growing in? Such as, when I mean um, specifically that, do you think it's advertising in movies, um, publish, um, uh, synchronization to movies, to video games, to toys? What do you personally think is going to be the biggest growth in the next couple of years? That's a good question because uh, I just actually went through all that because we just finished our, our budget for 2009 and we were going literally uh, by line item to see what's going to be really driving the revenues. And the biggest gain uh, that we'll get or the biggest year-on-year -year increase we get uh, from a percentage standpoint is clearly games. Um, there's a huge market for that now um, with Guitar Hero and similar types of things, uh, you know, all of these uh, uh, types of games are just an untapped resource. I think our games income in 2008 increased 84%. It's still, a regu it's still a relatively small number, so that's why you get the big percentage increases, but uh, that's a pretty nice percentage increase no matter how small the base is. Um, you know, and uh, so that's the biggest one. The second one was merchandising, believe it or not. People going into, you know, stores and finding the singing fish or whatever. Believe it or not, there are kooks out there that buy that stuff. I don't know who they are. I, I don't get it, you know, where you push the little button and it sings for five seconds. And after five minutes, the novelty is over. But those things sell. And uh, they're actually uh, growing at about 30% a year uh, for what we make. Uh, the tougher areas are what I call the traditional sink areas, advertising. Advertising companies are moving more, more towards uh, what we call library music. And library music is not popular music per se, but it's, uh, it's a cheaper alternative to, uh, to popular music. You want California Dreamin' and you can't afford California Dreamin', you go to a music production library and they'll give you something that'll give you the same kind of feel for one-tenth the price. So, um, you know, that's... Uh, that's creating pressures on our business, but actually, from a publisher's perspective, uh, we just bought BMG Music Publishing, and we uh, and BMG Music Publishing owns the largest production music library business in the world. So we, uh, you know, that that literally just uh, goes from, you know, uh, uh, one pocket to the other, for lack of a better term. But definitely, video games and merchandising are going to be two of the big uh, big increases we see this year, plus digital. You know, digital meaning mobile. Uh, uh, the only thing going down on digital is ringtones because people are moving to master tones, actual real songs on their phones instead of just some monotone uh, tone that came with the, the phone when they bought it. Today we were talking a minute about um, uh, resumes and interviewing, and I know there's going to be some, uh, a lot of uh, students want to get jobs as interns and also to, to be employed. Um, and you mentioned a couple of good things. Maybe you could mention them again here. Um, when you look at a resume, what are you looking for? Yeah, uh, well, the first thing I said when I was asked that uh, this morning was that uh, every interviewer is different. So I can only answer for me. Uh, and uh, I, I have interviewed a lot of people in my career. But, uh, you know, my style has always been uh, I look for uh, uh, three things. Uh, the first thing I look for is, uh, and the most important, I'll go in more of importance, is not on the resume. And uh, the first thing that I look for is I, I actually uh, look at it like, almost like I'm having coffee with the person I'm interviewing. What I want to know is, is this somebody I can work with? And that's just a feeling I get when I'm sitting and talking to somebody. Are we on the same wavelength? Are we the same type of person? Because I consider myself, you know, pr pretty easy to talk to and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, I like to try to make people comfortable when I interview them, but I'm actually trying to see and get a sense of, can I work with this person? Is this somebody I can you know, work with and, and have a good time? Because if I can work with that person, then I'm, 
I'm more than happy to work with them to get them up to speed. You can train them. I can train them. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. The second thing that I'd say is the most important, believe it or not, is for me, work experience. Even though you're coming out of school, I don't think many interviewers like to see somebody who hasn't done anything in the workplace. Uh, you know, it's good to just get, you know, working at a job shows, you know, responsibility. It shows, you know, that you, you're, you're getting some kind of credibility either in customer service or interaction with people that you work with or a sense of responsibility. It shows that you, you can show up on time, you can do a good job, that sort of thing. You know, so even if you think, you know, working in the local, uh, you know, uh, bar down the street is not uh, important, I think it is. I think it is. It gives you, uh, you know, uh, uh, a more comfortable feeling and an easier segue into the work environment that you've had some work experience, whatever it is. And the third most important thing is to see that your, what you want to do with your, with your, uh, with your career and, uh, and the items that are on your resume are somehow aligned. So if you want to uh, work in, um, you know, uh, copyright, and I'll I'm just making that up. If you want to work in copyright, then some of what you've done, either as an objective or, uh, or as, uh, you know, individual classes or a concentration that you've taken, should be pointing that that's kind of been your interest and now that's where you want to be. So those are kind of the three things that I look for. But there are people who interview and just look for the highest grade point average. I've never done that. Mm. I, I, I have never done that because that's not, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, people who are all over the map in terms of grade point averages. I've had, you know, I don't know, 4.0s that I can't work with. Mm. And I've had, uh, you know, much lower that I work with fantastically for years. So it's not one of my first things, but it is for a lot of people. You mentioned earlier today that uh, the interns in universal publishing were mostly on the creative side. Could you talk about that, uh, what, what, how somebody would appeal to you as an intern or appeal to your company? What, what would they need to know and how would they need to go about it? Yeah, you know, I, I guess uh, as an intern, you've got to realize you're going to basically be doing uh, what everybody else doesn't want to do. <laughs> you know, I mean, you come into a, a company as an intern and they're basically going to give you, you know, projects that they haven't got time for or that they think that you can get up to speed um, pretty quickly. Uh, the most important thing, and this is accentuating the obvious, is to, you know, treat it like it's a rocket science tree. If it's that easy, ace it and finish it quickly and show them. You know, this was, this was too easy. This was great, you know. But I think many people have a misconception, and I, I, I would like to clear it up, that, you know, um, music companies, it's a business. It's, 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 it's a real business. It's a fun business. And it's a very interesting business to work in. And as I like to say, uh, and I said to you before, that the only difference between music business and many other businesses in a lot of s senses is what you wear. You know, <laughs> what I wear to work every day. But we have, you know, finance people. We have lawyers. We have operational people. We have office managers. It's a business. It's a company. So, but I think a lot of people come in with a misconception that it's some kind of... Uh, you know, that's the music industry, it's a party all day long, it's not the case. And some of the people who come in for those internships think that specifically of creative A&R or film and TV, and that's all they want to do. They want to go there and they want to, you know, work in the, in the creative department because then maybe I'll be creative, that, which is kind of silly in a sense because it doesn't give you a broader perspective of the company and you, you're kind of, uh, you, you, you kind of lose out on the fact that there's, there's a whole lot going on in this business. So I think that the, you want to make sure that you don't uh, limit yourself in an internship. If you're lucky enough to get one, you don't want to limit yourself in an internship like that. You want to be able to be open-minded and learn, uh, you know, basically the business from the ground up. What about specific knowledge or skills? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I was, I was pleasantly surprised this morning when I sat in your freshman class, clearly the, you know, the curriculum that you have here is, I honestly think, you know, well above what I, what I would have guessed. And that, uh, you know, anybody uh, that you come into a, a you know, a, a job like that, people are going to want to expect that you have the foundation. And your education provides you the foundation. They're going to want to make sure that you have the basic, the basic knowledge of how the business operates. They're not going to expect that you can come in and do any job. 
you know, they're not going to point at a desk and say to you, okay, now this is what you have to do. You're going to be shown what you have to do. But what you do have to have are the basics, the foundation, the, the basic underlying principles of what the company's about and what they're trying to accomplish. So um, right now, uh, to get a job as an intern or just to apply for a job at Universal, just contact, go to the website? Well, the website will, uh, I don't know that the website lists internships. So I think the best way for internships would be to go through Georgia because I'm, <laughs> because I'm gonna be speaking with her about what I can do for, for Universal and stuff like that on internships. The website, uh, probably more um, interesting to, I guess, the seniors. Uh, because the website is actually the first place for Universal where all open uh, job positions go. It's not the only place you should look, but it's the first place uh, because I think uh, by law or by Universal's policy, certainly, every job needs to be posted. So literally, they post it, uh, and the reason for that is just to make sure that uh, there is a public record of that job being offered you know, publicly. So uh, you, you should uh, go on the website, and uh, it's really quite easy to find uh, for, uh, you know, what jobs are open and see whether you think it's a fit. And then, uh, you know, certainly apply from there. And then knowing somebody through the back door can usually make sure you get an interview. And after that point, you're on your own. But, you know, if you interview well and you have the credentials and, and you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, the name Loyola behind you, you should be in pretty good position. You mentioned earlier today about uh, how in an in rewing situation you might want to adopt or adapt your approach depending on who you're talking to. Could you talk about that for a second? Yeah, I call it communication flex. And I, I guess I learned this very early in my career that, you know, uh, uh, you know this may sound really fundamental, but it's, it's probably the most important thing I learned when I was in school. And that is the responsibility of, of, uh, of, of communicating and, and making sure that there's a connection when you communicate with somebody is yours, meaning it's, it's on you. And it's your job to flex your communication style to the person you're talking to. Uh, you don't communicate with everyone the same way. Uh, what you have to do is you have to be able to see somebody, feel them out, and communicate in a way that will be most effective for that person. Now, that's a skill that comes with interviewing. It's a skill that comes with interacting with friends and, and being in social environments. You, can, you, you all have friends. You have friends that are vastly different, and you probably deal with your friends differently. An interview is no different. You, know, you have uh, different people who need to be communicated to differently. And what people first, you know, another one of the big things they'll look for is how well does this person communicate and how well can they articulate you know, what their goals are, what they want to do, and and why they're the best person suited for that job. Okay, one more quick question. I know we're running out of time, but there are a lot of people here that, want, that write songs, and they want to be able to monetize those, those songs. How do they get to a guy like you? Hmm. Well, yeah, so uh, it's easy to get to a guy like me because now my, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my email's out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not the guy to get to. I mean, uh, what I do is, uh, I, and I have lots of people send me music, uh, either... Um, you know, by CD or, or by, uh, you know, uh, they'll email me a song on an MP3. Uh, and I always listen to it because I'm a music man. Uh, and by the way, you'd be shocked. Uh, I was going to say this when I was up there, but I just want to make sure you know, if we went into Universal Music, in, in our LA office, we have about 150 people. If I gathered them all here and asked them how many people, you know, were in a band or are in a band currently or have made an album or consider themselves a songwriter, 98% of the people would raise their hand. They're all there for a reason, because they want to be in the music industry. So everybody, even if it's a lawyer or a, a, finan oops, a finance guy, is that okay? You guys awake? Is everybody awake back there? Um, a finance guy or a lawyer, anybody has a musical background. So I'll always listen to it, and if I think it's good, I'll send it to the creative guys. And I'll, I'll send it, I actually will send it directly to the president of the company. Uh, if I think it's good, but you know that's me, you know, and I'm not the be-all, end-all. But uh, if I if I'm not sure about it, uh, uh, and uh, I get a lot of people sending me country music, and I'm not sure about country music because it's not my thing, so I'll send it to uh, the guy running our Nashville office, and 
I'll usually forward it to him in an email, and the, the cover line on the email will say, can you listen to this and tell me if it sucks? <laughs> because, <laughs> because I don't know. Uh, and he'll be honest with me and tell me if it does or if it's okay or if he thinks it's possible or whatever. And then it basically either goes from there or not. So, um, you know, uh, certainly, you know, uh, it's good to know somebody in the music industry because it's a, a, a foot in the door. Uh, and a good way to do that is to get a job hmm. in the music industry. There are many tales of, uh, you know, people who uh, uh, are very successful musicians who started off working as, you know, reception, administration, hmm. anything in a music industry. The guy who runs our film and TV department, which is a huge job, biggest publishing company in the world, started in the mailroom. I mean, uh, you know, 20 years ago, started in the mailroom, and he is running our film and TV worldwide. So, it's a Mike, good example. Thanks very much for coming. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me.